Feel the rhythm. Feel the rhyme. Get on up. It's bobsled time. Cool running. Bobsled time. That's a hair faster than the Swiss. Boy, that's a real big difference from yesterday. Well, this is an absolute shock in the making. Yesterday, they were falling down almost in the start. Now they slide into the middle. Yesterday, their heads were bobbing everywhere. Today, they're almost in unison. through the Omega looking possessed here. It's not the same team we saw yesterday. Where did these guys come from? Jamaica! Well, they're real serious because he's got a lot of fear about this big four-man sled. He's all over the course right now. Watch, watch. I don't think his speed's important here. He just wants to get to the bottom. to get his head under the cowling, try and protect himself. Oh, he's had problems there all week long. Man, I don't like that at all. He came off that outlet with a lot of power. Oh, look at the head. I don't like that. There are medical people all around the track. They will be there. We're not going to speculate as to what's happened here. We'll wait and find out. Again, the safety of this track has just proven itself over and over. Look at them, they're smiling. You see all four, you see there, one in front of the sled, two more directly behind the sled and behind the official, one of the Olympic officials. The fourth man is there. We are happy to see that the bobsled team is okay. They did not make it across the finish line, so they will not be racing in the fourth heat. And after that crash, I don't blame them for watching the rest of it. Ha ha! Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, um, just quickly, you may notice that my neck is slanted to one side. It's from that crash. I haven't really recovered yet. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But good afternoon, eh, Fest? Uh, 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 I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, I just want them. Man, you guys look like lost. Want them, that's Jamaican for what's up? What's happening? How are you? Right, so let's try that. Want them. Wah -mm. yeah. All right, and in Jamaica, you know, there's never a problem, so usually the answer is nothing. So, <laughs> so let's try that. Wah -mm. yeah. Oh, you guys are a quick study. I'm impressed. It's pretty cool. So look, you know, uh, excited to be here on my very first A-Fest, but one of the questions I'm always asked when people discover I'm one of the original members of the team, hey, which character played you in the movie? Are you guys wondering that? Yes. Yeah? I'm, I'm this guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, since then I went on a diet, I got a tan. This is a new me, you like? <laughs> I guess you're not buying that, are you? Well, the truth is that the characters in the movie are really different from real life characters. So if I had to choose one, I'd say I'm Yul Brenner, the bald headed guy played by Malik Yoba. The challenge is that people go, oh, so you're the mean one. But if, but if you may remember, he is a guy that wanted to go to Buckingham Palace to live. He was a dreamer, and that's how I see myself as well, as a dreamer. The next question I'm asking is, you know, so Jamaica is smack in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, 90 miles from Cuba, a 90 minute flight up, up to Miami. How in the world does someone come up with the idea to start a Jamaican bobsled team? I suppose you're wondering that too, aren't you? An inquisitive bunch. All right, I'll tell you. So um, the story is that two Americans who lived here in Jamaica, 
um, George Fitch and William Maloney. The two were in a local bar in Kingston imbibing some of the more potent sods we have on the island. Now, I wasn't there, but I have to believe that they were also enjoying some of the aromas we have. But I don't want to start on a rumor, so don't quote me on that, right? But they claimed they were drinking, and on this occasion, they were discussing the popularly held belief in Jamaica that Jamaican women and athletes are the best in the world. Now, here was your dilemma. There was no way for them to test the former without getting in trouble with their wives, so they decided to put the latter to the test. And how many of you have seen Cool Runnings? All right. You remember Sanka Coffee was racing this wooden cart down a winding mountain road? Well, we actually do do that here. I've never done it myself because it's really dangerous and I don't do dangerous things. <laughs> but they saw this, you know, two crazy guys going down the side of a mountain in a cart, thought it looked like bobsledding, except for the ice, of course. Then they discovered that a big part of a bobsled race is a start. You need sprinters. Guess where we have lots of sprinters? Well, as I tell my American friends, they actually have a lot more than we do, but ours are faster, so, you know, we win. <laughs> <laughs> so based on that information, George and Will approach the guys on a summer team to try and get them interested in this bobsled idea. And the response was, Bob who? Man, we live in Jamaica, the only Bob we know is Bob Marley, and he's dead. No, thank you. <laughs> so they came to the Army looking for athletes. At the time, I was a young lieutenant in the Jamaica Defense Force. And I'm getting a funny vibe here, man. What, you guys didn't know we had an Army here in Jamaica? Seriously? I mean, why do you think the United States have never even considered invading Jamaica? Huh? <laughs> I'm telling you, man, those coconuts make really good missiles, so, <laughs> so be warned, right? <laughs> so they came to the army looking for athletes. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, to be honest, I, when I first heard that Jamaica was about to start a bobsled team, thought it had to be the most ridiculous idea ever conceived by man. And I'm like, you know, nobody's ever going to get me to get on one of those things. But I think as human beings, that, that's what we do, don't we? Our knee-jerk reaction every time we hear an idea that is really outside of the, out, really far outside of the box or far outside of our sphere of reference, we go, oh, that could not work. So that was my initial reaction. But interestingly enough, the, the, the idea was intriguing to me. You know, not because I saw it as this awesome opportunity to go do something groundbreaking, but more because I saw it as a chance to fulfill an intention I had for about seven years. So when I was about 14, going on 15, it's 1979, the year I started running track. Uh, it was the ABC Wild World of Sports had a, a, a program on TV called Road to Moscow. The Moscow Olympics were coming up in 1980, and they were showcasing all these athletes from across the world, different disciplines, who were vying to compete in Moscow. And among the many things that, that, that kind of hit me was this idea that Olympic athletes are actually average and ordinary people. But they had extraordinary dreams, and they had an equally extraordinary desire to make those dreams happen. And so in that moment, this idea of becoming an Olympic athlete was born because I'm like, wow, you know, if I could just have an extraordinary dream and the desire, like everyone who succeeds in every other area of their life, you're average and ordinary, but you have these extraordinary ambitions and desire to make it happen, then I could probably become an Olympian. And then my colonel, of course, the minute he told me that I, or suggested that I should try out for the team, I mean, it was game on. I went from being ambivalent to, God, I don't know how. I just know I have to make this team. There, there was just sheer determination, sheer resolve, man. I was just intent on making this happen, just manifesting this thing. Uh, you know, so it's, it's like I could see the dream. It was right there. I just had to stretch, just a little, just stretch. Well, I didn't know how much I had to stretch, actually. And I had to, because this thing was tough from the very beginning, you know. Um, I'm a middle distance runner, and Bob Setting is about sprinting. So I'm there, you know, so I'm destroying the myth that everybody in Jamaica is Usain Bolt, you know. <laughs> no, there are some of us who don't sprint fast, and I'm one of them. Uh, <laughs> so I go to this Bob Setting team trial, and I'm trying to sprint as fast as I can, 
I'm, 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 I'm grinding it out, man. I'm grinding. I'm trying to perform as best as I can in each test over two days. There are about 30 of us vying for four spots, right? And I'm, and I'm like digging in. I'm, I'm hyper-focused. I'm not talking to a soul. I'm just kind of listening, trying to learn as much as I can. But, you know, it worked. I got selected to the team. This is uh, an original picture, a picture of the early picture of the four, er, first four guys. Uh, the white guy is not one of the team members. That's George Fitch. And <laughs> oh, you thought he was one of the team members? <laughs> uh, next to George is, is Michael White. Michael was a private in the Army, a radio operator. Next to Mikey is Samuel Clayton. Sammy was the only civilian on the team. He was an engineer with our railway company. And that's me next to him, a lieutenant platoon commander. And Douglas Stokes fills out the four where he was an army captain and a helicopter pilot. So um, this is us on our very first bobsled trip in Lake Placid, New York. And we went to meet our coach, the other white guy pictured there, Howard Seiler. Now, um, that black thing you see between us there, that's a two-man bobsled. And that's the first bobsled we're seeing in our lives. Now, this is September 87. Remember when the Olympics were? February 88. And that's the first time we're seeing a bobsled in our lives. <laughs> you know, so I talk, about, I talk about stretching. I mean, this, it was a steep learning curve, man. That weekend in Lake Placid, we were there, and um, the American team was on the ice rink, and, and we joined them in practice. We spent more time on our butts now we spent pushing the sled, so we had to learn to walk on ice, learn to run on ice, learn to push a bobsled. Um, you know, I had to learn to overcome my fear of speed and height. So I want to be a bobsledder, but I'm scared of speed and height. <laughs> so, so I had to learn to overcome that. You know, we had long hours of practice. I mean, just imagine going from 96 degrees in the shade here to minus 40 degrees in in Calgary. I mean, it's a shock to the system, right? right? Uh, and then, I mean, there were times when we just didn't know where the next meal was coming from. And so we figured out and we created these t-shirts and we started selling them so that we could eat. So it was, a, it was a steep learning curve. And on top of that, we were also learning to gel as a team. So we didn't know each other prior to getting selected on the team. And so um, you know, the, as you go through the, that forming stage and getting to know each other, you're getting to learn how to gel. Honestly, though, it was a little bit easier for the three army guys because we all spoke the same army language. You know, we were, we, we, we shared this mindset that we developed from our army expert uh, experience here. So that's a picture of Newcastle. The, the training depot of the Jamaica Defense Forces, perched on the side of the Blue Mountains, the other side of the island, boasting a beautiful, I mean, a magnificent view of Kingston and the seventh largest natural harbor in the world. But if you're in this beautiful place, going through basic training, it's a terror. It's one of the worst experiences in the world. But one of the things that they drilled in us is just this, no obstacles too difficult, no task too great. And I don't mean to sound corny. This is not, you know, a funny, fuzzy little saying. This, this is, it has been, it has become a, a, a kind of way of life for us. No task, obstacle is too difficult and no task is too great. And that's, that was a mindset we brought to our bobsled experience. And it created, you know, what I call a success mindset. And what is that? A success mindset is really, is an understanding. Actually, it's a knowing, it's a knowing that the key to success has absolutely nothing to do with where you're from. It's a knowing that the key to success has absolutely nothing to do with the circumstances that you've inherited. It has everything to do with a belief that through effort, through persistence, you can grow. You can get skilled, you can enhance those skills, and you can broaden your vision of what is possible for you. So it, it is with that mindset, that attitude, that we approached our effort back in 1988. And you know, when you have a success mindset, it does three quick things for you I want to share with you. One, it changes your internal dialogue. 
You know, so if you're setting out to do something like we did back in 88, you know, it's, I would say it's daunting, and it can be intimidating. It can, you know, intimidate you into getting into the cycle of, man, I don't know how we're going to pull this off kind of thinking. But we embraced it. We owned it. And when you do that, you know, as, as you got overwhelmed, as we did, as you got discouraged sometimes, as, as we did, you, you just change that dial. You start telling yourself, I can do this. I'm ready for this. I believe in myself. And that allowed us to, 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 to forge forward, right? So what your, your internal dialogue tells you what you can do, whether it's learning a brand new sport, starting a business, you know, or Miriam getting a date, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Your internal dialogue, you know, helps you to, to, to get there. The second thing that it does is that is it allows you to trust your ability to learn. I mean, I, you know this already. No one starts out knowing everything. You don't. But you have this belief that you can learn, you can grow, you can adapt to new situations. And that allows you to, 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 to really leap forward. And so, you know, back, back in 88, man, it's September, the Olympics are in February, there's such a steep learning curve. We were competing, I remember being at the Olympics, competing as hard as I can, but at the same time, whenever I was not on the track, when I wasn't getting ready to go down the track, I was out there watching other athletes, trying to learn. So, so that's us there watching the Australians as they were getting ready. Um, and, and that's us there watching the Swiss. We watched everybody, that's me there, <laughs> watching them trying to learn as much as we can so that we can move forward. The next thing about our success mindset is that it allows you to reinvent yourself. So if you're, if you're changing your internal dialogue, if you're you know, trusting your, your ability to learn, then you're, you're, you're going to change as a person. You're going to reinvent yourself. You know, every single one of you here as entrepreneurs know that you have to kind of take that leap of faith you cannot achieve something new without becoming someone new. And so when you have that success mindset, it allows you to do just that, to reinvent yourself, to transform yourself like I did from a middle distance runner who was dreaming of competing in the Summer Olympics of 1988 to a bobsledder who competed in the Winter Olympics of 1988. And when it does, so as I went through that as we went through that process, as we were to get to Calgary, there's one thing you know, that I never really thought about the experience in this way, but you, know, you have to have a higher purpose. I mean, the extent to which you excel at whatever it is that you do is directly related, I believe, to the extent to which you're driven by a purpose. So it's not about the what. Yeah, we were athletes, we were training, we were competing, we were learning a new sport. Um, it was exciting, and that motivated us, but it was more about the why. It was more about the why, and that drove us you know, a thousand times more. I mean, I don't even know how to begin to tell you how, how much of an honor it is to represent your country at the Olympic Games. I don't even know how to begin to tell you that. I mean, to be there carrying on your shoulders the expectations and the aspirations of an entire nation I mean, it's, it's, it is an awesome responsibility, but it's invigorating, it's exciting, you know, it, it, it really pumps you up. And as a result, when you, when you connect with that higher purpose, man, it really drives your actions, right? It really um, forges your, your discipline, right? And, and at the same time, it allows you to become far more resilient. It allows you to... To, to ride through, weather the storms through the tough times, right? To really cope when it gets tough, when it gets difficult. Like, like when you crash a couple of times and you're not sure, sure how you're going to eat later on and you're freezing your royal Rastafarian mayonnaise off. <laughs> you know, it, it, it does all of that. And it also allows you to ensure, to, to, to know that failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that this is an immutable, unbreakable principle. When I say failure is not an option, this is an idea, this is an attitude 
that says, man, I'm going to work harder, I'm going to dig deeper, I'm going to become even more creative to find a solution that's going to help us to achieve our goals. Because, guess what? Failure is inevitable. Right? It's not a contradiction. If you're learning, if you're growing, it doesn't matter how good you are, how competent you are, how careful you are, simple by being human, you're going to have some missteps. You're going to fall along the way. You know, this picture here represents the pinnacle of our athletic accomplishments back in 88. So we went from, so if you think it's funny that we went from not knowing anything about bobsledding, never seen in, seeing one in September until September 87, to compete in the Olympics in February 88, well, guess what? This bobsled, this four-man bobsled race in the Olympics was our first ever four-man race in the Olympics. Want to hear more? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you can't see him really well there because he's being blocked. The guy on the back, Chris Stokes, was not even on the team at the start of the Olympic Games. He had come to the Olympics to watch his brother Dudley race. And it was the second week of the Olympic Games, four man, and we go, hey, let's enter four man so we can all win a medal. We go, yeah, because it wouldn't be fair for only two of us, and caring is sharing, sharing is caring, right? So, so we entered the four man event that week, and in three days we taught Chris everything we knew about pushing a bobsled. <laughs> we only needed three days, we didn't know that much. <laughs> But look, that's us there coming off the hill with the seventh fastest start time. First race ever, first week ever, Chris's first four days ever. <laughs> seventh fastest start time. But then I did say that failure is inevitable, right? You know how the story ends? 48 seconds later, we're on our head. 48 seconds after the pinnacle of our success. We are at the deepest, deepest depths of our failure. I mean, let me explain something to you. When you cross a bobsled track, like we did, upside down with your runners kissing the skies, that's a failure. I'm kind of curious, how many people, your show of hands, have ever failed? Those who didn't put their hands up, they're lying, I tell you. <laughs> how many of you ever failed and felt like a loser? Let me see the hands. Keep the hands up. How many of you ever failed and felt like a loser on international TV. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just me? Yeah. You? Oh, I have, ah, right. I have company. But you see, it, 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 it demonstrates clearly that failure isn't fatal, right? Failure, when, no, when you hit rock bottom, friends, it's not a conclusion, man. It's a foundation. That's where, that's, that's a spot where you build from, right? As when we failed, when we crashed, if there was one thing we're certain of, we're going to compete again. If there was one thing we were very clear of that day is we're going to be at the Olympics again. And, and we have been and we have done tremendously well in our best performance ever in 1994, 14th out of 30 in the four-man event ahead. We beat the Italians, the Russians, the French, and my American friends. You were 15th, we were 14th. <laughs> yeah. The other thing we learned, and I, and, I, and I try to teach this as often as I can, is that winning is not always about the final score. And you know, when you look at, at our experience here, yes, we crashed. So in pure sports terms, we failed miserably. But then if you take into account the journey over the four and a half months or so, going from September not knowing what bobsledding is to being at the Olympic Games, that kind of sounds like a win to me. And, and that's, that's the challenge I have for, for all of you here, to start looking at your failures as an opportunity to learn and stop being so great at beating yourself up. Become just as adept 
and learning from those experiences and, and cheering yourself on and understanding that, as I said earlier, it's not rock bottom, it's a foundation from which you can build. And so you've still won, although you may not have hit your mark, because you have grown, right? You would have grown from the experience. You may have touched some lives. You may have uh, inspired some people. So, so those are, in the quick 20 minutes, I think I just went over the ideas, the lessons I wanted to share with you. Excited to be here with you uh, on this A-Fest. Looking forward to hanging out with you. We'll be on the beach and doing other... I'm not a beach guy, I'm a bobsled guy, but... <laughs> 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 what can I say? I'm here, so we'll do it. Thank you.